We are honored to welcome from Atlanta, Georgia, from Cameron School of Theology, Dr. Jehu Hansels, who will be speaking to us today. If English is good enough for Jesus, uh, so we're looking forward to hearing that. Uh, he comes to us from Candler School of Theology, Theology at Emory University, but has spent time in Fuller Seminary before that. Had a few stops uh, before that, but comes to us orig originally from Sierra Leone. Uh, I hope you will give a warm Church Street welcome to Dr. Hansel's discernment. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, this is my first time in, in Tennessee, uh, first time in Oxford, and uh, I'm liking it so far. We'll see. <laughs> it's, it's been great. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, Anthony Wilson and uh, the Education Committee uh, for, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's been about two years in the making, but I'm here and, and uh, I'm just delighted. Uh, one quick note, um, I don't want you to read if English is good enough for Jesus, you stop right there. But as a, an omission in the rest of the title, it should read uh, Christian Nationalism, Immigration, and the Remaking of American Christianity. Okay, all right. But, uh, you know, let's, let, let's get going. I, I want to talk about... Migration, I'm going to talk a lot about migration. It's, it's a primary area of research for me, and I teach a class on immigration and the American church. So those, those issues, which are pretty much the foremost of a, a lot of our conversations today, uh, you know, center in the things I, I, I teach and, and, and research. Uh, friends, uh, human migration is a fact of, of history. But as long as human beings have been on the planet, relocation, displacement, and population transfers have been uh, part of the human condition. Uh, you can understand why migration has been described as an irrepressible human urge. Experts will tell you that migration has been crucial for human development. It has been a constant and influential feature of human history and enrich many cultures and civilizations. The impact of migration on religious existence is especially profound. The, the global religious landscape, as we see today, is very complex. It's constantly evolving. But the worldwide spread of belief systems is largely the product of extraordinary migration movements. Migrants don't take everything with them, but they take a lot. Especially, they take their ideas, their beliefs, their religious practices, and their spirituality. Interestingly, the role of migration in the global expansion of the Christian faith is one of the most fascinating facts of history. I would argue that Christianity is the primary exhibit of this connection between migration and the spread of religion. Because for Christians, migration is not simply incidental to our story. It is intrinsic to the Christian faith and integral to the Christian mission. In a way that is not quite the same with other religious traditions. <coughs> To get into this would require a very different talk. But let me say this. This much is clear from the biblical tradition. We encounter every form of migration in the biblical account. You could make a very strong case that the biblical story and message would be meaningless without migration and mobility. From a biblical perspective, Migration emerges as both a metaphor for the life of faith and a distinctive feature in divine purposes. But let's talk about the present. No matter where you get your news, or in what form, and even if you don't really pay attention to the news media at all, 
It is difficult to escape the fact that coverage of desperate migrants and displaced populations worldwide is a constant issue. The perils and tragedies surrounding global migration remain one of the most dominant and distressing things of our time. I am fully aware that in addition to the extensive media coverage, migration, the rise of non-white migration specifically, is one of the most fraught and politically divisive issues in many parts of the Western world maybe even in the US. Never in the history of humankind has migrant movement been this voluminous, unrelenting, and extensive. <coughs> there are more people on the move today globally than ever before in human records. In 2019, According to the UN estimates, there were 272 million international migrants, people living outside their country of birth in the world. This is the highest number of people living abroad in recorded history. If they all lived in the same place, that place would be the world's fourth largest country. Incidentally, cold statistical data never tells the whole story or convey an accurate picture in part because migrant data is always incomplete. If you go back to 2019, nearly one person was forcibly displaced every two seconds as a result of conflict or persecution. There were over 26 million refugees in the world and more than half were children. The religious dimensions of these global flows is not always appreciated or factored in analysis. But based on 2012 data, Christians constituted nearly half of the world's international migrants. Which is to say, there are more Christians among the world's migrants and displaced peoples than adherents of any other faith. Many of you know that the U.S. is home to more international migrants than any other country. As I will make clear in a short while, it also receives more Christian migrants than any other nation. Friends, ultimately, global migration flows are both an expression and indictment of our broken world. And it should be abundantly clear by now that this phenomenal tide of human migration is both unmanageable and unstoppable. The COVID-19 pandemic taught us as much. Remember, the pandemic erupted in a world already marked by a tidal wave of international migrants. But for a while at least, it looked like global mobility would never be the same again. Within a matter of weeks after the pandemic broke, at least 174 countries had implemented travel bans and border closures. By May 2022, 90% of the world's population lived in countries with largely closed borders. I suspect that some of you listening to me now, uh, belong to families or had strong ties with people who were badly afflicted by COVID, maybe even lives that were lost in COVID. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I know that that pain continues, that journey of grief uh, will you know, last for a long time. So I want to bear that in mind. Because I want to make a few more comments about the pandemic. By May 2022, the novel coronavirus had killed over 1 million people in the US alone. 
on average, over 1,300 Americans died every day for a period of two years. Entire families were wiped out in the process, and many of you grieved. But I also want to make this point that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in this country disproportionately was disproportionately borne by poorer and brown populations. For immigrant groups, the COVID-19 pandemic intensified aspects of their lives that were already a source of anguish and pain. In part because the pandemic galvanized pre-existing anti-immigrant sentiments, intensified suspicions of <laughs> foreigners, and uh, made their the, uh, life as outsiders particularly painful. You see, the interesting thing is that the pandemic intensified hostility towards immigrants in the US was striking for two reasons. First, because there were immigrant populations were the most affected or worst affected. Second, because immigrants were overrepresented on the front lines of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. There were 29% 20, of physicians, 38% of home care, health aides, and 25%, 20, 38% of home health aides, and 25% of personal aides. That such a high proportion of immigrants were involved in saving lives at great personal cost and sacrifice makes mockery of the replacement theory. But well, let's get back to the conversation. Even in the face of unprecedented global travel restrictions, the challenges and dilemmas surrounding global migrations did not go away. The crisis of mass migration and the calamitous displacement of people did not cease. Throughout 2020 and 21, there were unprecedented violence and displacement crises in the Sahel region. The abrupt withdrawal of the US from military from Afghanistan in August 2021 also triggered another massive wave of migrant movements and evacuations. Then came Ukraine. Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 set off the fastest mass migration in Europe in at least three decades. Within 50 days, over 10 million people fled that country. And just in case you're wondering, the recent conflict in Sudan, which erupted in uh, April 2023, has already, already displaced 3.5 million people. The point I'm making, friends, is that migration, international movement, people displacements, refugee uh, movement, these are facts and these are constant realities of our world. But the Ukraine story has also exposed the built-in inequities of global migration. To many neutral observers, the open arm welcome for those fleeing Ukraine stood in sharp contrast with the treatment of previous waves of refugees in Europe from places like Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. Well, the most obvious reason is that the people affected in the Ukraine instance uh, were, were white. And that must be acknowledged, it's part of our story. The warm welcome those migrants received from governments in European countries uh, who had previously implemented stringent anti-immigrant measures uh, was uh, very striking. 
quick pause for a note, because I think this is important. I want to mention that 85% of the world's displaced peoples are hosted in poor developing countries, not by rich or wealthy nations. And I also want to comment in passing what I regard as the African myth, because media coverage of migration often features uh, Africans. Let me be clear that, the, that Africa contributes a smaller percentage of international migrants than the rest of the world. Just 2.5% of the African population are international migrants. And of that 2.5%, less than half leave the country. That's just a small notice in passing, if you will. <laughs> The fact remains that no matter the data, the blatant discrimination and racial rejection intrinsic to global migration is coming. But here's the point I'm trying to make. That in the final analysis, the rigorous travel restrictions and border closures occasioned by the pandemic did little to stop global migratory flows. In fact, international migration has surged in the wake of the pandemic. <clears throat> the economists uh, noted recently that foreign-born populations in wealthy nations is actually now rising faster than at any point in history. In the UK, Brexit was partly motivated by the desire to control migration from the rest of Europe. It hasn't really worked in terms of migration. In 2022, 1.2 million people moved to Britain, the most ever in recorded memory in a given year. And so the economists were going to say, I quote, a new wave of mass migration has begun, unquote. I hope you get the point. Migration, displacement, movement of people due to all manner of crises and challenges and dilemmas is a fact of human existence, period. But there are lessons that we should mention. Because if the COVID-19 pandemic showed us that human migration is an irrepressible fact of history and literally unstoppable, it also taught us a couple of other things at least. The first is that anti-immigration is as entrenched as migration. Which is to say, and this is not just about wealthy nations, even in the developing countries, uh, there are strong anti-immigrant sentiments present in most nations in the world, from India to South Korea to South Africa and Brazil, and of course to North America, Europe, and the, and the rest. The pandemic exposed the link between international migration and widespread <coughs> resentment and hostility towards foreigners and immigrants. Perhaps the clearest indication of this paradox are the building of border walls. You see, folks, just over 30 years ago, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1991 was celebrated as marking the end of an era of fixed borders and immobility. Yet today, the situation is much worse. Border walls have proliferated around the world. By one estimate, 74 border walls exist across the globe, and most were erected in the, in the last two decades. At least 15 more are in some stage of planning or building. And uh, at least a third of these are intended to halt 
unwanted deliberation. Another lesson we should point to from the pandemic, it's related to the first, is that the border closures open suspicion of foreign looking inhabitants, whether they're citizens or not, uh, tapped into this pre existing and long standing opposition to non white immigration. And the association with the coronavirus outbreak galvanized white nationalism in church and society. White nationalism is an ideology that covers a broad assortment of ideas and ideals, including commitment to white dominance, rejection of multiculturalism, the tendency to view non-white immigrants as invading races, and promotion of exclusive racial existence. It has been the chief source of violent attacks and terrorist plots in the US in the last couple of years. But especially as it pertains to immigrants, communities in the US, it is the resurgence of white Christian nationalism that I think should be of primary interest. And Christian nationalism is an ideology that conflicts Christian identity with whiteness or being American and insists on political control. The most recent analysis suggests that it is endorsed and embraced by 20% of Americans. So let's talk about America. <laughs> so on the issue of immigration, two things have always been true about the US. First, it is the definitive immigrant nation. Second, it is the definitive anti-immigrant yeah. <laughs> nation. Yeah. This is another way of saying that the vociferous, vociferous anti-immigrant debate and hostility is so palpably evident uh, in our public discourse today in both the church and community is nothing new. Certainly didn't begin with uh, the Trump presidency. Um, even if that presidency did stop the spheres in, in significant ways. Let me try a few samples with you if you don't mind. Few of their children in the country <coughs> learn English. The signs on the streets are inscriptions in both languages. Unless the stream of their importation could be turned, they will soon so outnumber us that the advantages we have will not be able to preserve our language, and even our government will become precarious. This was not recent, written recently. In fact, these are the words of Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> writing in the 1750s. <clears throat> and the group he had in mind were German immigrants. Since you're so receptive, let's take a look. <laughs> Many American citizens are not Americanized. It is unfortunate as it is new natural that foreigners in this country should cherish their own language and peculiar customs and carry their nationality as a distinct factor. Certain quarters of many of the cities are in language, customs, and costumes essentially foreign. Many colonies are proud of lands and so set themselves apart from Americanizing influences. In this case, that was evangelical leader Josiah Strong writing in the and here is the one that you've all been waiting for. <laughs> if English is good enough for the one word for it. It's good enough for 
Texas school children. <laughs> she may actually deny this, but that was Miriam Ferguson, governor of Texas. <laughs> Anti-immigration is just as American in some ways as immigration. But friends, what never ceases to surprise me is the amnesia, shall we say, in our own churches, in pews and pulpits, regarding the fact that immigration is foundational to the American church that immigrant congregations have been a constant feature of American religious life and a bedrock of American Christianity. The recurrent influx of immigrants from other parts of the world has perhaps been the single most crucial ingredient in the religious vitality, religious growth, innovation, and global impact that has long characterized American Christianity. This is as true today as it has ever been. But what are we seeing today? So, by the end of the last century, America had re re resumed its st status as the de destination of the world's international migrants. The stats are on the slide. By 2018, 45 million immigrants, uh, roughly 14% of the population, uh, and it will continue to rise by most estimates. I feel I should point out that the majority, uh, over 70%, are in the country legally, and that more than half are proficient in English. Because those facts don't always seem to be uh, uh, presented in public uh, discourse. But what is interesting is that unlike earlier waves of immigration, the overwhelming majority of this current wave are of non-European stock or non-white, just over half from Latin America, another 25% from Asia. Friends, this post-1965 uh, immigration wave is already having dramatic transformative impact on at least three areas of American society. First, it is playing a hugely significant role in population growth. From 1965 to 2015, nearly 59 million immigrants arrived in the U.S. In absolute numbers, that's the highest of any period in American history. These immigrants and their US-born children are projected to account for 88% of the US population growth moving forward. So that's one. Second uh, area of impact has to do with the demographic makeup of America as a nation. The racial and ethnic composition of American society has changed, is changing, literally before our eyes. And this is evident in the sharp rise in multiracial identities and unprecedented culturalism. But let's be clear. The U.S. is perhaps the most complex, culturally diverse society in the world. That is not going to change. This current wave of immigration will make it even more so. And this would imply that Anglos or non-Hispanic whites will increasingly be a minority population. Third is the impact of these new immigrants on the religious landscape. That is likely to be more extensive than any previous wave with significant implications for the American church. You probably don't need me to tell you 
that this current wave of immigration uh, includes people from diverse religious affiliations. Uh, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus have been admitted. Although, and let's be clear, their combined total amounts to only a small proportion of immigrants and a very tiny fraction of America's total population. What is all too often overlooked is that post-1965 immigration is also predominantly Christian. In the present era, the U.S. receives more Christian migrants than any other Western nation. Christians account for about 65% or more of this immigrant population. The U.S. admits more Christians than Muslim refugees. Um, uh, it, it, it admits a lot of Arab immigrants, the majority of whom are Christian. From 1992 to 2012, close to 13 million Christian immigrants gained permanent residency in the U.S. Really, I could go on and on with this. Um, by the most conservative extrapolation, over 30 million Christians have been added to the American church in the last 50 years. I would say this, regardless of your Christian tradition, of where you place yourself in the religious spectrum of America's deeply polarized Christian landscape, this is a profoundly significant finding. We have to ask ourselves, especially those of us who actively <coughs> pray for a clear sense of what God is doing in the world, we have to ask ourselves why is it that such a momentous development in the life and history of American Christianity is completely lost or denied amidst the sound and fury of our debates and contentions? The inattentiveness to immigrant populations in assessments of American Christianity is quite odd. Not really just because of this fact, but as I keep trying to remind you, because immigrants have had a consistently profound impact on the American church throughout the history of this nation. If I were to put a, you know, a, a, a name on it, to say a short explanation for why uh, many Christians are inattentive uh, uh, to the, the uh, Christian significance of immigration, I would say it's because our Christian responses really stem from our political ideologies, not from biblical teaching or pastoral uh, experience and outlook. And by the way, just to be clear, most surveys and analysis suggest that the majority of Americans are, welcome, are open to immigrants. I think 60 to 66 percent believe that immigrants strengthen the country. If you're looking for strong anti-immigrant <laughs> positions, it comes from white Protestants, white evangelical Protestants. They are actually distinct in every survey and analysis in viewing immigrants as a threat to the America's way of life. And friends, when I talk about this, when I talk about white Christian nationalism as a rising phenomenon in the US, I'm not looking at any particular clearly identifiable group. Because the white Christian nationalism, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, takes a variety of forms and expressions. And it occurs on the spectrum. There's some who embrace it fully, there are others who encourage it, there are others who lean into it, there's some who 
uh, open to it. So it's it's not. I'm not looking at any particular one group uh, when I when I say that. But that being said, we have to be clear about uh, its its uh, uh, implications. In its worst forms, it conflates Christian identity with a particular national heritage and certain values. In its most extreme forms, it prioritizes political power and influence over personal piety. In its most extreme form, it views Christian beliefs and practices as markers of, of belonging to indicate who fits in and who does not. But I would say this, Unless you value cultural heritage over allegiance to Christ, unless you are inclined to the view that real Americans are native-born white Christians, unless you are inclined to use Christian language and practice primarily as markers of belonging and privilege, then the massive historic infusion of Christian immigrants in all their variety and diversity into American society over the last few decades calls for celebration and also serious reflection about what this means for the American <clears throat> church. I'm drawing to a close, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I'll make one more point before I close with the two lessons I feel we should take away from this talk. <laughs> You're all probably aware or conscious of the drumbeat of assertion of the last, at least last uh, three to five years, of the steady decline in the number of American Christians. Even claims that the American church seems to be dying, or some aspects of it is done. There is some indication that Americans who identify as Christian are reducing in numbers. This, what is called disaffiliation, seems to be uh, taking up or accelerating, and it is most prominent among Protestants, both evangelical and non evangelical. <laughs> The long-term impact of the COVID pandemic on these statistics are, are still uncertain. But I'm reprising this just to make this point, that this, even by those who track these trends closely, the decline, so to speak, is a white Christian phenomenon. America is no longer a majority white Christian nation because the decline among white Christians as a proportion of the American population is where the trend is clearest. Where does this leave us? This is a complex question. I have limited time. Um, allow me to conclude with these two observations for a common reflection. The first is this, and this is the same reminder. The first is that immigration has continually presented the American church with unexpected gifts. That's the first uh, reflection I feel we need to get our heads around. I often have to remind my own students that every major Christian denomination in America began as a group of immigrants meeting someone. And all the Methodists should be shaking their heads. <laughs> because that is the Methodist history. The church in America came into existence through immigration. No major immigrant wave has left America or the American church untransformed. 
Now, there is no denying the fact that Christian immigrants can often bring with them theological views or spiritual outlook that can add tension, you know, into the attention into the mix. That is true, and we must recognize that. But friends, they bring so much more. And their growing presence helps the American church to realize its full blessings and potential to the extent that they remain alienated, divorced, and removed from our own partnerships, relationships. We undermine the potential of American Christianity. Whether or not they're helping to slow down the decline is a complex question. America still has the largest Christian population of any uh, country, um, but what they're doing most clearly is that they're, they're diversifying the American Christian experience. These Christian immigrants encompass a multiplicity of worship traditions, spiritualities, and religious networks. They have significantly widened how Americans do church and in what language. They have also intensified a browning, quote unquote, air quotes, a browning process. By which I mean that since the majority of these new immigrants are Christian and they come and they're predominantly non white, the American church is browning and diversifying at a faster rate than the wider society. Let's be clear. A greater majority of American Christians will be non-white long before that change takes place within the wider American society. So that's the first area of reflection. Finally, as we close, let me suggest this. And not, not only must we reckon with the historic role of immigration on the American church as an unexpected gift, this situation calls, in my opinion, for a new understanding of church. Let me explain. Friends, the church is not designed to simply be a place of cultural or social solidarity. It can be that, but not only that. The church is also intended as a site of transformation. It is not just for people we like or people who are like us. But when I say church, I mean church broad. Migration or immigration is now at the heart of the most serious predicaments and challenges that confront Christian congregations and, 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 and uh, communities uh, in this country. In this new age, our attitude and response to the outsiders and immigrants in our midst will be inseparable from our ability to demonstrate the renewing and transforming power of God's new community. You see, we talk about the American church, but it is more accurate to say the church in America, because the church never belongs to a country, a society, or a particular culture. The church belongs to Christ. <coughs> Living with this conviction calls for repentance and continual reform in the power of the Holy Spirit. It also calls for understanding that the purpose of the church is not to invite others to become like us, but rather to invite them to become like Christ. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.